The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our free educational webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss the International Low-Grade Glioma Registry. My name is Antoinette Tu, Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Elizabeth Claus. Dr. Claus is the Professor and Director of Medical Research at the Yale University School of Public Health. She is also the attending neurosurgeon and director of stereotactic radiosurgery within the Department of Neurosurgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. She is a member of the Board of Advisors for the Acoustic Neuroma Association, as well as the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States. Dr. Claus's work is focused on cancer and genetic epidemiology with an emphasis on the development of risk models for breast and brain tumors. She recently served as co-chairperson of ABTA's Patient and Family Conference, where she launched the International Low-Grade Glioma Registry, and also has previously spoken on other topics for ABTA's free educational webinar series. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Claus. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the support of the American Brain Tumor Association in letting me uh, introduce our international low-grade uh, glioma registry. So I have my disclosures listed here. So welcome to everyone this afternoon and thank you for joining me to hear a little bit more about our new low-grade glioma registry. I wanted to start by discussing a little bit about what we're using as our definition of low-grade glioma and we'll give a few more details later on in the presentation but I wanted to start here. So essentially, low-grade glioma is a generally slow-growing tumor of the brain, and it's called a glioma because it arises from uh, glial cells in the brain. So there have been a lot of uh, changes recently uh, based on the World Health Organization, or WHO, histology groups, and we're trying to incorporate both the older coding schemes as well as the newer coding schemes. So traditionally, gliomas have been graded from uh, 1 to 4. Grade 1 tumors generally occur in uh, children and are believed, at least at this point, to be a separate entity from grade uh, 2 through 4. So in our current registry, we will not be including grade 1 tumors, which are primarily pediatric. And in part, that's because we really want to focus on the uh, adult low-grade tumor so that we obtain a sufficient sample size to answer the questions that we're hoping to pose. So our focus in the registry will be adult grade 2 tumors of the brain. So we're not including uh, spinal cord tumors, but just tumors of the brain. And at least in the older classification for WHO, that included uh, tumors that had terms such as astrocytoma, oligoastrocytoma, which uh, also went by the name of a mixed glioma, and oligodendroglioma. Uh, of interest, that middle group, the mixed gliomas, is no longer being used as a category in the new guidelines. Uh, but since we hope to incorporate patients diagnosed over a wide range of time period, we'll be including all three groups. When we talk about high-grade glioma, four, uh, we're including the anaplastic tumors and then glioblastoma. Now, one question that's already come up a few times is, some individuals are graded formally as a grade 2, but there's some suggestion that their lesion might be a grade 3. So we are including those individuals uh, who are formally graded as 2, but perhaps have some features uh, that are higher grade. And so one of the things that drives us for this registry are these recent reports, both in the New England Journal of Medicine last summer, as well as uh, WHO data that the tumor molecular marker and genetic data probably better predicts prognosis and may better predict response to treatment than does uh, histology. So this is some data from the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States. It's a population-based registry that gathers uh, data on brain uh, and spinal cord tumors. And just to give you some feel for the number of individuals, at least within the United States, uh, that are diagnosed uh, with low-grade glioma every year, and we think it's about 3,000. Uh, at least within the United States, the average age is about 41 years, 
and there are slightly higher rates reported for uh, males versus females and uh, whites versus non-whites. So basically there's very little data on low-grade glioma, how to manage it, what it means, and because of this we've now been able to partner with uh, the ABTA, uh, employ social media to develop a web-based data collection process to study low-grade glioma. You'll also hear me mention uh, a term called LOLIO, which is a group of collaborators at a number of uh, U.S. and as well as outside the U.S. based institutions who are trying to collaborate together to advance study of this relatively rare tumor forward. So what are some of the goals and why have we taken to uh, using a web-based registry approach? So traditionally uh, in the past, we've used registry-based uh, data to get our studies going. So for example, in the state of Connecticut, which has the largest statewide uh, tumor registry for certain cancers, such as breast cancer or colon cancer, you would go to the registry, get a listing of cases, and then after obtaining physician consent, approach those individuals. So that's easy to do when you have a relatively common cancer, but when you don't have a common cancer, such as low-grade glioma, it becomes very expensive because you have to uh, go through a number of registries to get sufficient amounts of data or observations for your study. The other problem is individuals that live in areas that aren't included in these registries then are not eligible for the study. So we wanted to broaden who was eligible. The other thing which I mentioned that patients may not be aware of is generally for these sorts of studies, your physician or healthcare provider has to give us permission to approach you. And so if a particular healthcare provider isn't able to or does not wish to participate, then the patient never hears about the study and isn't able to decide for themselves if they'd like to join. So by doing the methods that we're using here, it opens it up essentially to uh, everyone. So another goal is basically we're hoping to improve patient access to results by making things available through either the ABTA or our own website. Whatever information we have gets out there uh, much more quickly. And it's interesting, although uh, where I practice, it's a relatively large, uh, predominantly cancer center, the majority of low-grade glioma patients are estimated to receive care outside of those large cancer centers. And we're seeing that there are pieces of information that perhaps those patients or their healthcare providers uh, currently don't have access to. So we're hoping to change that a little bit. The other big thing, especially in the time of uh, tight budgets and reduced grant funding, is it is uh, much more economical and generally we can move more quickly when we do things through uh, a web or smartphone based uh, application. So we did a similar registry for the study of acoustic neuroma and we were able to compare the cost per individual or participant that we enrolled versus our older style studies where we went through registries and obtained physician consent. And essentially the new method costs us about $175 or $200 per participant enrolled versus $1,500 to $2,000. So much more economical and frequently you can uh, do things much more quickly. The other thing that is so important nowadays, especially for rare disease, is to be both comprehensive but collaborative. So this group that I've mentioned, Loglio, includes faculty at present from University of California at San Francisco, Yale, Brigham and Women's, uh, Emory, MD Anderson, and a number of other locations. So we meet on a regular basis and the data that we collect not only will our group use, but it will be used by these other researchers, some of whom uh, their papers are listed there. They include the TCGA uh, staff as well. So to try to have a central resource and not reinvent the wheel, but where everyone's included, everyone gets together and has a say in terms of what data should be collected, how it should be collected. So I think that's a, a great way to go now and really something that needs to happen. So one of the things that we want to look at are genes. And so I just wanted to give a little terminology here. So when I'm talking about genes, what am I talking about? And so essentially we hope to examine genes both that are germline, meaning passed on from parent to child, and that we can measure either through blood. In this study we're going to uh, do saliva 
but also tumor or somatic genes. So those are genes that are in the tumor tissue. And so in addition to asking people to provide a saliva sample, we also are asking for permission for our team to go back to whatever hospital or hospitals patients may have had their glioma surgeries at so that we could obtain that and look to see what are the changes in those tumors, how did the changes uh, vary according to treatment and over time, uh, and also to look at the, the germline. So we know now that both your inherited and your acquired tumor genetic factors are important, both for risk as well as for response to treatment. So there is some progress, and many of the individuals listed on some of these uh, papers here are a part of our low uh, glio group. So uh, over eight germline genes uh, have been found, which are associated with risk. And in addition, some nice advances. I, I mentioned that last summer there were several papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of which is listed here, that basically found that above and beyond histology, meaning astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, or mixed, that tumor characteristics, in particular whether or not you have a IDH mutation, a TERT, T-E-R-T mutation, or you have deletion of pieces of two chromosomes, 1P and 19Q, that these turn out to be extremely important in subtyping these tumors and predicting both response to treatment as well as outcome. So we're realizing that it's not just knowing about histology, but knowing about these characteristics. So what that means and why we have to get more low-grade glioma uh, cases is that once you divide all the low-grade glioma tumors according to these three characteristics, you really start to have very small groups available uh, now. So we need to collect big numbers across all the groups so we can get uh, good estimates of what's happening in each group. So when we had our meeting uh, last in Washington, D.C. in August, we all cataloged what low-grade glioma cases were available that had all the uh, data necessary. And across all these groups, which are pretty much the, the largest cancer centers within the country, we only had 651 individuals total. So we know from our calculations we need at least 2,000, so that is our goal now, to have at least 2,000 low-grade glioma uh, patients enroll. And it will obviously take us a number of years to uh, do so. We're anticipating the whole project would probably take us about uh, five years total. So why are we doing this? What are the things we're looking to study? So first of all, we want to better define what we should be doing clinically for low-grade glioma patients. It's still very confusing both to healthcare providers and patients as to what the best course of action should be. Should you do a biopsy only? Should you do a larger surgery? Depending upon what you find, should you then move to chemotherapy? Or should you wait until a recurrence happens? Should you uh, do radiation therapy? We want to really help guide clinical decision making, both at time of diagnosis and when and if individuals have recurrence. So we mentioned already, we want to look for genes both in the germline and the tumor associated not only with risk of getting a low-grade glioma, but looking to see how do you respond to treatment and would that help us guide what treatment and when we would give treatment. So another important aspect is working a little bit on providing better information to patients about everyday uh, quality of life and living. So. We have noted when uh, patients come from outside locations that they may or may not have been given information on what risk, if any, does this mean for my family member in terms of glioma or other tumors. Conversations about family planning. Uh, there's some data out there suggesting that women that have a low-grade glioma may or may not have an increased risk of tumor advancement. Uh, when they go on to become pregnant, and even driving rules. So state uh, by state, there are different driving rules. If one has had a seizure, some states have no rules. Other states uh, ask the patient not to drive for up to uh, nine months. And many people are not even aware that these uh, pieces of information are out there. So just to standardize counseling and information given to patients and to the healthcare providers, many of whom may see all sorts of patients, breast, colon, ovary, and brain, 
and find it difficult to keep up on the details of every single cancer. We also want to learn from the patient what things are of interest to you uh, that we may not be thinking about. Um, for example, a very interesting patient that I met up with yesterday who was not able to obtain a second opinion because their insurance did not cover it. So learning about that, how does that come about, what can we do to make things better. We're hoping eventually uh, to develop, and we're pretty much there, a smartphone application because we're interested in seeing what is the association of things like physical activity and diet, sleep, uh, with quality of life and outcome. So there's a vast amount of literature for other cancers, breast, ovary, that show that physical activity and exercise improves not only quality of life, but seems to be associated with increased survival. So it's likely that that is also true for brain, but really no one has looked at that. So that's one of the things we're hoping to look at. And again, we want to serve as a collaborative resource for the other investigators uh, in our group. So those are sort of the overarching uh, ideas that we'd like to look at with the data that we're collecting. So here I'm just presenting a little bit uh, more formally what we're considering to be uh, eligible individuals. So the uh, study subjects would be age 21 to 79 years at time of diagnosis. So it might be that now you're 45, but as long as you were 21 to 79 when you received your diagnosis, uh, that's fine. We do ask, and this is one thing that's quite different from how we've done things in the past, we're trying to involve patients. We do ask that patients uh, provide a copy of their pathology report for us to confirm that that individual is indeed eligible for the study. And it also helps us a bit with personnel and cost if patients are willing to help out a little bit, uh, it reduces the cost for us to have to hire an individual to then go to uh, the pathology department and uh, get those records. And nowadays with uh, electronic medical records, Epic and whatever system your hospital might have, many patients are able to just simply log on and then email us the pathology report. So there are no restrictions with respect to sex, gender, race, uh, when you were diagnosed, uh, where you live. The uh, registry and the materials at this point are only available in uh, English. We have had some requests to uh, develop it in Spanish, which we're hoping to do in the future, but at least at the moment it's only provided uh, in English. I'm listing here uh, the different WHO uh, groups. So it's mixed astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma under the new guidelines, uh, which just came out. Uh, and as you notice here, the mixed is no longer included as a category. It basically would include diffuse astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma, but no anaplastic uh, lesions or glioblastoma. We have a few other exclusions here. These are primarily uh, lesions that are seen in children, but are occasionally seen uh, particularly in the young adults. We're trying to make our group as uniform as possible so that we can really say something with uh, good certainty uh, when we find our results. So how do you join the study? Uh, we have a number of uh, different ways and this is going to increase over time. We've had great support from a, a wide variety of organizations and groups who have agreed to put a link to our study uh, up on their website. So. Uh, you can contact us at glioma at yale.edu. Uh, we can send you the link through that, and you can actually, if you'd prefer to upload your pathology report or consent straight to that, that, that is fine as well. We have a barcode that you can scan and get in that way. And the uh, ABTA has been kind enough to advertise our uh, registry, and I have a little snapshot off of a smartphone here, and uh, this is also the, the website that you can go to to register. So how to begin, one thing I will let you know is that if you'd like to take a look at what questions are asked or what information is needed, uh, you can always visit first as a visitor. And we also have that available so that if your doctor or healthcare provider would like to take a look at what we're doing, you can certainly do that. If you uh, think you might want to uh, join the study, 
you can either start for the first time as a new user or if you need to look up some information, you can come back as a returning user. We do have um, uh, a Yale undergraduate student who's serving as support staff. So if you have problems uh, such as you forgot your password or uh, something seems off, we'd be happy to help you. And you can contact us at glioma at yale.edu. So essentially, you go through, and there's a few basic questions that you're uh, asked. And these, this is the overview of what we're uh, requesting. So first of all, we need your written consent. Uh, the consent can either be sent to you via email, or you can download it from our website. It goes through uh, in detail the different components of the study. Uh, and once you uh, take a look at it, and we'll show you a picture of it in a minute, you would uh, sign it and send it back to us. We also are asking for your glioma pathology reports, and it's for all of your glioma surgery. So one thing we're very interested in is individuals that have had multiple surgeries over time, looking to see does the tumor look different, are the genetic variations different after treatment, how are they different, and how would that inform what the next step would be. If you have any uh, molecular testing, so the most common things that people might have had done are testing for uh, 1P and 19Q or IDH. Uh, we'd love to have that as well. Those tests are fairly expensive. If you haven't had them done, we'll be running those tests on a tumor, but if you had to have them done, it saves the study a little bit of money. There's an online questionnaire, which just asks a few basic pieces of information about where and what treatment you had. And also, we're trying to gain information about uh, different symptoms that you might have. Do you have seizure associated with this, difficulty thinking, are you able to work? Uh, just to get a little bit better picture for what are the needs of low-grade glioma patients, because most times these studies have incorporated low-grade glioma as just a subset of a larger high grade. So we really want to focus on the low grade people. Uh, as mentioned, we're hoping to obtain a saliva sample. That's what lets us look at the germline uh, genes and a tumor sample. That's what um, makes us be able to look at the uh, somatic or inherited. In the future, uh, we're hoping people will consider uh, allowing us access through either the health kit or we'll eventually be using a Fitbit uh, but smartphone collection of neurocognitive as well as activity and sleep data. So this is uh, what the consent looks like. If you go online, uh, as most consents, it, it is a bit long, but it's at the end portion here that uh, would look for your name, your address. The address would be the location where you would want us to send the uh, saliva kit. So, uh, just make sure to think of that. We wouldn't want to send the saliva kit someplace where you don't want us to send it to. Email, signature, and date. Once you uh, upload this or email uh, this, we can send the uh, saliva out, kit out to you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the pathology report, I just wanted to show individuals this is the sort of thing on the pathology report that's helpful. It indicates that you've had some genetic testing already of uh, your tumor. And so at least this is an example of how something might look at our hospital. Every hospital is a little bit different, but these are the sorts of things that you'd be uh, looking for. So how do you get a saliva kit? So as we mentioned, uh, we would have to have the written consent and the pathology report. And you can fax it, email, smartphone. People have been taking pictures and uploading it uh, that way. This is uh, basically what you would get in the mail. So it's a little uh, kit in a plastic container. There's also a specimen bag and then a little mailer which has our address already on it. And uh, at least within the United States, the postage is paid both ways. So little. Uh, video here that I'd like to show people so that you can uh, get a good feel for how, when the saliva kit arrives, what we're uh, hoping that you'll be able to do. So let me just turn on that video.
The Origin Self Collection Kit is designed to collect saliva samples for genetic analysis and testing. To use the Origin Kit, open the packaging, remove the cap, and the container. The cap contains a clear solution that will be mixed with the saliva sample when the kit is closed. Do not remove the plastic film. Prepare to deliver your sample. To stimulate saliva, you can rub your cheeks or wiggle your tongue around. Relax and collect as much saliva as you can in your mouth before making your first spit. Place the top of the container close to your bottom lip and start delivering your saliva sample by spitting into the container. Some people will have bubbles or foam in their saliva. Be sure that you spit enough liquid saliva, not including bubbles, to reach the fill line as indicated on the illustration in the instructions. You will find the fill line on the side of the container where the inside of the kit slopes upward slightly. Once your saliva reaches the fill line, place the kit on a flat surface and tightly close the container using the cap. You will know the kit is tightly closed when the notches in the cap line up with the notches on the container. This solution stabilizes and protects your saliva sample until it is analyzed at the lab. Mix your sample with preserving solution by inverting the kit several times. Origin is easy to use and completely So let me go back then to our presentation. And that will also be on the website for you to take another look at should you be interested. We have written instructions as well. They're included in the kit when it is uh, sent to you. So once you've collected the sample, you would place the specimen into the specimen bag and there's a little sticky at the top of it. Uh, to keep it closed. You want to make sure that the cap is very tightly placed. Uh, you can sometimes, although it's a little bit light here, a little click, but also note that the wedges in the cap uh, line up to the wedges on the bottom portion. And then you put the clear bag in the manila uh, bubble wrap envelope and return it via mail. And as I mentioned, at least within the United States, the postage both way, ways is paid by our study. So. The online questionnaire, what are the sorts of questions that are uh, asked? Here I have some uh, photos taken from a cell phone. You can do the questionnaire on a cell phone. It might be easier to do it on your computer, uh, but either works OK. It will also work on a uh, tablet if you happen to have that. So a few pieces of background information. Uh, we'll ask your date of birth, how you heard about us. That helps us. Uh, figure out what's the best way to reach people, have you had chemotherapy, when did it start, and all of the questions we just ask that you answer to the best of your ability. Uh, if you don't know something, you don't remember something, can't get access to information, you can skip uh, to the rest. As I said, we're also trying to uh, figure out and eventually collect it multiple times, but what sort of symptoms, uh, what things are affecting people's life for low-grade glioma getting a little bit better feel for that. So we ask you at the, the end questions about that. So in the future, this isn't ready yet, but uh, we're moving very quickly uh, towards it. We're going to both for um, iPhone and non-iPhone smartphones have an app that will allow us to collect activity data, including steps uh, as well as sleep, and let us uh, test you for neurocognitive uh, function, memory, uh, speed in your hand, uh, and we're hoping that people will be interested in doing that, but having us again get a baseline uh, about neurocognitive functioning, how active are low-grade glioma patients, and comparing that to both high-grade as well as persons without such a diagnosis. So I think that will be a very exciting aspect of the, the study, we're moving towards that very quickly. So one thing we ask is, can you tell other patients and help us out. That's our primary uh, hope. We need patients to tell other patients. We eventually will have uh, an aspect where patients can enter in the email of other patients. We would not get that information, but would send uh, an introductory email to the suggested person. And if they're interested, they can join our study. Uh, if they're not interested, uh, we don't receive any information on them. So that's one computer-generated uh, way in which we're hoping to have uh, patients refer other patients. But also, if you're at a meeting, Facebook, Twitter, 
uh, any sort of way, even the old-fashioned uh, you uh, tell other individuals would be a great uh, help to us. The other thing we have to think about is although we are broadening uh, to everyone uh, entry to the study, there is always a concern that people without the internet or without social support may be left behind and we don't want that to happen. So if you have ideas about how to better include people that might have uh, reduced economic or educational situations, uh, that would be wonderful. We're going to work very closely with the ABTA and other groups to try to include everyone, but uh, there's always the fear that when you broaden uh, access in one way, you may uh, narrow access in other ways. We did find in our acoustic neuroma study that we had a higher proportion of whites and women uh, who entered the study then would uh, the population based data suggest would be seen for acoustic neuroma. So we have to work fairly vigilantly uh, against that. Low-grade glioma individuals tend to have a young uh, age at onset, so tend to be very computer savvy, but we want to make sure we're open to everybody. So we also want your input. Are there things that we're not covering that you are interested in? Are there questions that we're not asking? And we've already gotten a few good suggestions, even on the existing online questionnaire, about uh, better ways to do things in terms of how we request the information, what we're asking patients to do, what's clear, what's not clear, uh, what are you interested in participating in, uh, is there any interest in future clinical trials of exercise and outcome. So let us know uh, what's of interest, what we're not covering, and you can contact us always at glioma at yale.edu. So I wanted to thank you all for uh, spending the time to uh, listen to our webinar today. And I also uh, want to thank, of course, the American Brain Tumor Association. Uh, we've also received some startup funding from the National Brain Tumor Society, uh, the Loglio Collective, and the Dabiri family. And then the young man that uh, you see over here, uh, this gentleman, as well as uh, Laura Script, who's a PhD candidate at Yale. Uh, these two individuals are uh, graduate and undergraduate students working with us on the project. Uh, Luke is supported by the Michael Manzella Foundation through Yale University. And so uh, the three of us will be uh, answering your questions. We'll be the faces behind the glioma at Yale.edu. And I also want to acknowledge here Ying Lu. She did uh, essentially all of the programming for the questionnaire, so a lot of hard work and effort. She was a Master of Public Health student at Yale a few years ago and is now getting her uh, PhD in epidemiology at uh, Vanderbilt University. So I just want to mention all those great people. So I would uh, be happy now to uh, answer any questions if uh, anyone has any. Thank you so much. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Claus. Um, again, as Dr. Claus mentioned, um, now we will move on to our question and answer session. So if you have a question you would like to ask her, please type and submit it using the question box in the webinar control panel on the right-hand side of the screen. And then I'll go ahead and read them aloud for her. So, um, so we have a question. Um, are there any treatments or medications, um, either past or current, that would make someone ineligible for the registry? No, so that's a, a great question. We really hope to gather a wide range of treatments and timings in terms of surgery so that we have a big picture of what's going on with low grade glioma. So as I had mentioned earlier, in some instances, uh, especially probably about 10 years ago, people traditionally would have surgery and then uh, their physician would watch and wait. I think there is a larger move now to move to chemotherapy and or radiation therapy after surgery, uh, but either scenario is fine. And even if you are now a higher grade glioma, as long as initially you were low grade, uh, you'd be included in the study. Thank you. Um, also, another question regarding eligibility. Um, are there any cases in which um, a grade one or grade three glioma would be eligible for this LGG registry? So the grade one, because we think genetically they're quite different from the two and above, we are not including in the registry. 
the threes, there is a lot of conversation now in the scientific community about whether the threes should be included with the fours or with the twos. We're hoping to stay fairly strictly to just the grade twos, but we are including grade twos that have perhaps a component or suggestion of being a grade three, but are formally read out on pathology report as being a grade two. Sometimes it can be very hard for the pathologist to say if something is a two or a three. Uh, so for those, we are including them, because we think it will provide valuable information about the twos as they move to three. Great. Um, another question is, how do I obtain my glioma pathology reports? So it'll vary a little bit um, according to whether or not the location where you had surgery has electronic medical records. So many places now, uh, patients are able to sign up for access to their medical records. Uh, Epic and a few other uh, systems throughout the U.S. are used. If you don't have that or perhaps you're not feeling computer uh, savvy enough to do that, you can generally contact uh, your neurosurgeon or even your neuro-oncologist, any of your doctors, and they can help you obtain it. Or you can contact the pathology department uh, where it was reviewed. Great. Thank you. Um, someone also mentioned that um, if they don't have any of the, the three mutations you talked about, um, like would they be included or not included and how would they find out more information on that if it's like a different type of mutation other than the three that you talked about? Right, so it depends. Um, they Some places actually are not yet testing for any mutation, so some patients may not know whether they have a mutation or not. So there's no inclusion or exclusion based on either those three markers or any markers. Uh, it's just that you have to have the pathology of the astrocytoma mixed or oligodendroglioma. Uh, more and more places are starting to test for those and other markers. The markers tested vary across sites. So Brigham and Women's Hospital may test for a certain uh, group of markers, and UCSF may test for similar but some different ones, and so on and so forth. So we're seeing very different things from different hospitals. Uh, but and, and some people may not know if they have been tested or not. So whatever you have and can pass on to it, but it's, it's only the pathology that we need to confirm. Great, thank you. Um, another person is asking, is it possible to give consent only for a saliva sample, but not for their brain tumor sample? So it's one consent, but you can let us know if you would prefer us not to obtain uh, tumor tissue. So I know that there, some people have a concern that they may need that tumor tissue in the future uh, to be tested to determine eligibility for a clinical trial or whether or not a certain treatment would be appropriate for them. So the process is generally that we go with consent to the pathology department where you've had surgery and that pathology department makes the decision about whether they have sufficient material to give us. And sometimes they'll say, we don't have enough, we need to keep this for the patient, you can't have anything, and so, you know, that's fine. In other instances, there's a large amount of material and they will feel comfortable giving it to us. So it's the pathology department at that hospital that makes the decision. Uh, but if you have any concern, you certainly could just let us know that you would prefer that we not obtain any tissue. Thank you. Um, also, someone wanted to know, um, once they submit all their information, what is the typical response or turnaround time to find out if they're uh, eligible? Meaning, oh, well, I think we're trying to be pretty good. It's usually within a day or so. Uh, the students generally don't work over the weekend, so if it was Friday afternoon, you might not hear till uh, Monday. But I, I think we have a pretty quick turnaround. Okay, so if they don't hear within a few days, um, is it okay if they follow up and should they? Oh, absolutely. Now? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, just send us another email and I'm patrolling the email as well, so. 
<laughs> but the, the, the two students are actually quite good. So Great. Um, another person is asking, um, with the data submitted, is it secure um, in regards to, you know, like data theft or anything? Like, how can they be confident that it's, you know, secure, confidential information or not like, you know, data? Absolutely. So it's secure. It's on the Yale University Secure website. So for us to do any of these studies, we have to go not only through an institutional review board, but we also go through uh, technology review. Uh, and so we've gone through both of those. Each group has signed off. And so we use uh, Yale University servers. Great. Um, also, could you let us know um, you know, the goal for how many participants you'd like in the registry and what the current status is? So we just started, we have probably about 100 people so far, but we're hoping for 2,000. And we're imagining it's going to take us probably almost five years to, to do that. And we've also applied for uh, funding through the NIH as well. That's great. So you said like if, you know, other people know, other people that might be interested, they can help promote it on social media um, or... Absolutely. That would be great. That's what we're hoping. And then um, if people don't have like internet access or smartphones, is there any other way to get it to them? Like just should they just print it out from their computer and just bring them like the information and assist them? Sure. That would be great. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Okay. And I think eventually we'll also try to have written materials that we uh, pass out through the, the Brain Tumor Association. Okay, great. Um, another person is asking what happens if they don't have pathology reports? Can they still participate? So we do have to have pathology report, and that is essentially almost an NIH requirement. Anytime you are studying whatever disease it is you're looking at, you have to be able to confirm that the group that you're studying has the outcome of interest. So we, we would need a pathology report. Otherwise, we don't know, you know, what we're essentially looking at. Okay, great. Thank you for um, clarifying that. Um, Another person is asking, what if they have a grade two astrocytoma when they sign up, however it progresses to a higher grade during the study, what happens? So as long as at uh, first diagnosis you had a low grade glioma, you would be maintained in the study. And we are hoping that people share if they have recurrences that information because it's extremely valuable and there's very little data on it but to have these uh, sort of paired samples where you have it at a time of diagnosis and you have it later and you know what the treatment was in between because then that tells us did the treatment do anything pro or con for the tumor. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, Another question is about the study and the data itself. Um, besides any quantitative data that's collected, will there be qualitative data that will inform um, quality of life um, information that will be collected as well? Yeah, so we'll, we'll do a little bit of both. So in the questionnaire, we use what is a standardized means of uh, gathering data on quality of life. It's called the MOS36. So that's validated. It's been used in many uh, study populations, many cancer study populations. So we use that, and that allows us to compare with you know, some scientific rigor quality of life for this group. We also have uh, what's a standardized listing of symptoms, uh, for example, weakness or difficulty thinking, driving, uh, seizure. Most of the uh, panels that we use are already very well validated both in brain and other uh, tumor groups. But we have a few uh, places, and we'll have a little bit more of this when we get the app up and running, where we're going to ask people open-ended questions too, and that helps us gather information on things that we may not have thought about. Great, thank you. Um, another person is asking uh, how do they let their doctor or healthcare provider know that they want to participate in the study and what happens if 
the doctor or healthcare provider is against them participating in the study, but they want to, what do they do? So in this study, you don't need anyone's permission other than your own. Um, it's probably always a great idea. Any questions to discuss them with your physician, but the physician or healthcare provider, uh, we don't need their consent for you to enter. It's completely up to you. Which is that's something different than we've traditionally done. It's opening it up to the patient themselves. Great. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Let me see um, if there's any that are submitted. Um, will participants receive periodic updates of the study and its insights? So we generally have to wait until we get all the data to perform both the laboratory and statistical analyses. And part of that is just economy of time and cost. Uh, so what we generally do and what we've done in the past is once we've done the analyses and we have publications coming out, we share the publications or any materials back with the, the patients that participated. But it generally does take a few years for us to gather enough data. Some of the laboratory analyses and the genotyping that we do are fairly complex. The analyses are complex. For example, for a given person, we'll generate over a million pieces of information for each person. So it, it takes a little bit to do the analyses correctly and, and write all that up. Thank you. Um, will you, will the applicants that are not, if they're accepted or not, will they be followed up with? And if they're not accepted, will they be given the reason why? Yes, yeah, so anyone, and we've had one or two uh, individuals that sent us a pathology report and it didn't come under our eligibility guidelines, but so we uh, tell that individual why, so that you, you do understand who is uh, eligible and who is not eligible. All right, I think that's all the time that we have for questions today. Thank you again um, to Dr. Claus um, for your wonderful webinar presentation, and thank you all for joining us. I'd just like to say besides our free educational webinars, the ABTA has a variety of programs available to help connect patients and caregivers with information and resources to help support them in their brain tumor journey. We also have publications and resources for healthcare professionals on our website. If you would like additional information, please visit ABTA's website at www.abta.org, or you can call the ABTA Care Line, which is staffed by caring professionals at 800-886-2282. We're going to go ahead and pause for a moment just to conclude our webinar recording.